Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Collective Impact, Opportunities and Challenges for Implementation. My name is Kat Goldsworthy, and I'm a Senior Research Officer here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Today's webinar presentation will provide an overview of collective impact with a focus on leadership and governance, community engagement and evaluation. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting. In Melbourne, the traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders from other communities who may be participating today. Firstly though, some housekeeping details. One of the core functions of the CFCA Information Exchange is to share knowledge. So I'd like to invite everyone to submit questions via the chat box at any time during the webinar. We will respond to your questions at the end of the presentation. We'd also like you to continue the conversation we begin here today. To facilitate this, we've set up a forum on our website where you can discuss the ideas and issues raised, submit additional questions for our presenters and access related resources. We will send you a link to the forum at the end of today's presentation. As you leave the webinar, a short survey will open in a new window and we would appreciate your feedback. Please remember that this webinar is being recorded and the audio transcript and slides will be made available on our website and YouTube channel soon. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Jessica Smart, Kerry Graham and Arlene Hand. Jessica Smart is a Senior Research Officer in the Practice Evidence and Engagement Team at AFES. She works across both the Child Family Community Australia Information Exchange and Expert Panel Projects. Her previous work has been in the not-for-profit and health sectors, developing, delivering and evaluating community development and population health projects, including projects with young people, people with intellectual disability and culturally and linguistically diverse groups. Kerry Graham is a founder and director of Collaboration for Impact, Australia's leading organisation for enabling people to tackling big, tough problems and create large-scale impact through collaboration. In this role, Kerry provides support to and curates learning for communities, corporations, governments, philanthropy and non-profit organisations on how to drive large-scale social change in intractable social challenges. Kerry also lectures on collaborative practice with Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales. And finally, Arlene Hand has worked in the community services sector for over 20 years, working in both not-for-profit organisations and local government. She has a passion for working on community and sector development initiatives with her early career starting in youth work. Over the years, Arlene transitioned to community development and project management roles in early years youth and mental health sectors. Arlene joined Communicare, Communities for Children, in 2015 to initiate and guide the Community Dimensions Collective Impact Project in the early years. Unfortunately, Arlene is unable to be here today, so we'll be playing a pre-recording of Arlene's presentation for today's webinar. This means Arlene will be unavailable for the Q&A session at the end, but will be available to answer questions via the online forum on the CFCA website. Please join me now in giving our presenters a very warm virtual welcome. I'll hand over to you, Jess. Thanks, Kat. So as you've heard from Kat, we've got three presenters today. Um, I'm Jessica. I'll talk about the theory and evidence for collective impact. Then we'll hear from Kerry Graham, um, who'll give us a national perspective on collective impact. And finally, you'll hear the recording of Arlene's presentation, which is a case study of a collective impact project in Armadale District in Western Australia. Okay, so we'll start at the beginning. What is collective impact? It's a framework that's used to achieve population level change on complex or wicked problems. And that is problems like homelessness, family violence or obesity, um, problems with multiple and intersecting causes and problems where interventions to address them can have unknown and unpredictable outcomes. The term collective impact was coined by Kanya and Kramer in an article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review in 2011. So only, what's that? six years ago. They presented collective impact as um, the opposite to isolated impact. So actions taken by a single organization to address a single issue. And Kanye and Kramer argue that isolated impact has not been effective at addressing complex problems. So collective impact is designed to work in complexity. 
Um, and in a collective impact project, agencies, groups and individuals that have an interest in the particular issue come together and they use the collective impact framework to guide their collaboration. And stakeholders usually um, include a mixture of non-government agencies, like various departments and levels of government, private business, community members, and particularly community members with lived experience of the issue. Um, and depending on what the issue is, but people from other sectors, so it might be um, people from the education, health or transport sectors. And collective impact has been rapidly adopted in Australia, particularly in the last few years, and Kerry will talk about this a little bit more, and it's most frequently employed in a place-based setting. So collective impact works through these stakeholders coming together and applying the five conditions. And the five conditions um, you see there, that's a common agenda, continuous communication, the backbone, mutually reinforcing activities and a shared measurement system. I won't explain these. Um, if you're not familiar with them, you can check out the Kanye and Kramer article, Collective Impact, which is in your resources. Um, I do briefly want to mention the backbone though. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about a few things that I think are particularly promising about collective impact. And one of these is the backbone. And the backbone is the name um, that's given to the supportive infrastructure that can stay, sustains the coalition or collaborative of stakeholders. And this is an essential function um, that I think has been really overlooked and under-resourced in a lot of collaborative change efforts. And I think it's something really valuable that collective impact has brought to the field. I recently heard someone describe collective impact as a skeleton um, that needs meat on its bones. And I think that was a really apt description. So I think these five conditions provide a skeleton or a framework to achieve collective impact, um, but by themselves, um, they're not enough. And there's been some criticism of these conditions, mostly to do with what is missing from them rather than a criticism of the conditions themselves. Um, but in my opinion, and I've written about this in the collective impact paper that's available in your resources, the gaps in the framework are now mostly addressed um, by other resources or by evolutions of the framework, such as the Tamarack Institute's Collective Impact 3.0. So before I get to our three topics for today, I think it would be remiss of me to not talk about what the evidence is for collective impact. And I'm going to start by talking about what we don't have. So we don't have conclusive, irrefutable, high quality evidence that collective impact is effective. We don't have any systematic reviews or any meta-analyses that can tell us without a doubt that implementing a collective impact project is likely to have population level impact. There is some projects, particularly in the States and Canada, that have reported positive results, but we don't yet have consistent high quality evidence. And why don't we have that evidence? Well, not because collective impact is ineffective necessarily, but simply because it's relatively new. So it's only been six years since um, Kanye and Kramer published their article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. And collective impact is really still evolving and settling into something that can be evaluated. And we're still working out what collective impact actually means and how best to do it and what it looks like in Australia as opposed to the States or Canada. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really new and even more so in Australia than in North America. Um, many projects here are still in the early stages of development. Um, Kerry may talk more about this, but I'd say there's very few collective impact projects in Australia that have progressed um, enough to be measuring outcomes. So what do we know? Well, we know that collective impact is in line with what we think is the most effective way to address complex problems. We know that comp complex problems need intersectoral and multi-level interventions, and collective impact can provide a framework for that. We also know that there's been rigorously evaluated collaborative initiatives in public health that share many characteristics with collective impact. So I'm talking about things like communities that care in the United States, and we know that they've demonstrated effectiveness. So today, um, each of us, myself, Kerry and Arlene, are going to focus on three areas that provide opportunities and challenges for collective impact. When I first started reading about collective impact, I was actually pretty sceptical about it. And I think mostly um, that was because of the way the early articles promoted what I understood to be a very top-down approach. And as a um, community development practitioner, I just couldn't see um, how we could achieve large-scale social change without citizen participation. But as I, um, as I read more about it and as I spoke to people that were implementing it, I changed my mind on this and I now think that it has significant potential um, not only to address complex problems um, but also to improve the way that some things are done in the social services sector. In saying that, I think that a lot of work needs to go into implementation I think that the potential of collective impact isn't a straightforward or an easy thing to realise. Um, and that's why I chose these three topics to focus on today. 
so community engagement, leadership and governance, and evaluation. I think each of these areas are challenging for collective impact in that if they're not done well, they limit the effectiveness um, of a collective impact project. But on the other hand, if they are done well, they not only enhance the effectiveness of a collective impact project, but they can also have a positive impact on the way um, on the way we do things in the social services sector more broadly. So I'll start with community engagement. And this was one of the major initial criticisms of collective impact. And it was my biggest problem initially with collective impact as well, was that it didn't include the community and collaborative change efforts. Um, to be clear, when I say the community, I mean the citizens, um, the residents of an area in which a collective impact project is taking place, and specifically people with lived experience of the issue which the project is trying to address. Um, I should say that now there's actually many collective impact resources on community engagement. It's um, quite a hot topic, I think, in the collective impact community. So we talk a lot about community engagement and how important it is. And certainly there's a lot of ethical arguments for why community engagement is necessary, but there's also practical reasons to do community engagement. Um, and these practical reasons mean that without meaningful community engagement and participation, a collective impact project is less likely to be effective. So firstly, there's often significant differences between people working on a collective impact project and people who are the intended beneficiaries of the project. So these might be differences in education, employment, income, cultural or socioeconomic background and life experience. And these differences mean that unless we do community engagement, we're really relying on assumptions about what the community needs and what the community wants and how we should deliver these um, responses. Community members are experts on the local context and we really need that knowledge to design effective strategies and solutions. Secondly, and this is discussed a lot in the collective impact literature, including community members increases the chance that a project will achieve transformational change. So there's two reasons for this. Firstly, um, involving community members necessitates a shift and a rebalance in power dynamics. And secondly, if we only have services and government involved in a project, we're likely to get service oriented solutions. And while it's important that we have effective services, they really only um, they can really only alleviate the symptoms of a problem and they can't really address the causes of those problems. So community engagement is important, um, but it's not easy to do in practice and I think it's rarely done well. And this is true across the whole social services sector. So I'm not just talking about collective impact projects here, but genuine community engagement really requires a paradigm shift. Um, and I like the way that Harwood talks about this as a turning outward so that the community becomes the focus of a change effort rather than the agencies who are involved. And finally, I think community engagement is most effective when it brings community members um, together with people who have power, so the decision makers in a community. And I think um, that there's some collective impact sites that are doing that really well. And that brings me um, quite neatly to the next area I'm going to talk about, which is leadership and government governance. So again, I think if these are done well, if leadership and governance is done well, I think it can really provide an opportunity for innovation um, in the social services sector. I want to talk about two things here, and I call them opportunity challenges, because I think like a lot of the other things I'm talking about today, they are both an opportunity and a challenge. So the first of these is the need to combine top down and bottom up leadership, and to do this in a way that ensures all voices are heard and given weight. Governance structures need to be flexible enough to facilitate meaningful community engagement and participation, but they also need to be strong enough to hold a, um, a really diverse group of stakeholders together through what can be um, an uncertain and unclear um, and at times a really slow process. Um, and linked to this is the challenge of combining different data sources, so combining research evidence and population level data with community knowledge. The second um, opportunity challenge is the shift in leadership style that's required by collective impact. So more so than kind of your traditional authority-based leadership, I think leadership and collective impact is relational. Leaders have a facilitative role and they're responsible for the health of the collaborative as much as, as, much as they're responsible um, for the outcomes of the collaborative. And this requires leaders to build and maintain trust, to be effective communicators and facilitators, and to be able to do this with a really um, diverse group. And I think this is a difficult um, but a crucial role, not only 
because you need to keep stakeholders engaged and motivated, but also because you really need to build a culture that is non-competitive. So a culture where you can recognise um, what's working and you can scale that up and you can recognise um, activities or interventions that aren't working and you can change or stop those. And for this to happen, you really need to build and maintain high levels of trust and, um, and a safe to fail culture. So finally, um, evaluation. I think there's no doubt that evaluation is one of the most challenging areas for collective impact projects. Um, but I also think that the use of data-driven decision-making is also one of the most exciting things about collective impact. And evaluation generally, I think, is unloved in the social services sector. It's often seen as challenging and expensive. It's not prioritised. Um, often practitioners or managers don't have evaluation skills. And I think evaluation is quite often seen as an add-on to the essential business of service delivery. Um, well, I generally disagree with that. I think that evaluation is particularly critical for collective impact and for collective impact projects to be successful, I think they really need to embrace evaluation. And there's two forms of evaluation that I think are both critical. So the first of those is ongoing data collection and evaluation for continuous learning. When you're working in complexity, actions and interventions can have unanticipated effects. So it's important that they're monitored. So um, through monitoring, you can see what's working and scale it up and you can see what's not working and you can change it. And this type of monitoring and evaluation, I think can be done in a couple of different ways. So you can use um, developmental evaluation methodologies or you can use something more like an action research cycle. I think that so much of the power and potential of collective impact is in the way that it responds to complexity um, and, is and is adaptive to changes in the context. And evaluation for continuous learning really enables that. Um, secondly, is evaluation for impact. So the shared measurement system is part of this story. Um, it can determine whether or not a project is having an impact on population level outcomes. Um, but evaluation for impact, and I'm talking here about evaluating outcomes, can also provide um, accountability to stakeholders, including community members and to funders, and also contributes to the evidence base for collective impact. So I talked earlier about what evidence we do and we don't have for collective impact. If we're not doing rigorous outcome evaluation, not only do you not know the impact of a project, but you also can't build and share knowledge and contribute to that evidence base um, about how collective impact works. Okay, so that's it for me. Um, I'll now hand over to Kerry. Please do remember to submit questions via the question box and Kerry and I will be able to answer them at the end of the presentation. So over to you, Kerry. Thanks so much, Jess. Really stimulating start to the webinar. And hello, everyone. Um, so Jess has asked me to speak today about um, what are we seeing nationally in the collective impact movement. So in order to be able to comment on that, I just want to spend a moment saying what vantage point does CFI have to see, see um, national patterns? So we're a very small nonprofit that um, seeks um, the only role we play is to enable people and collaborations to do the work of um, changing the system in their place or on the issue that they care about using collaboration. So quite often we describe our role as walking alongside collaborative efforts um, for a minimum of seven years to help them build the capacity and the infrastructure needed to, for, to drive large scale change. So we, what we've been seeing is that since Collective Impact was published in 2011, there's been a fairly steady increase over time. Um, many initiatives that were using collaboration as a way to make change read the Collective Impact article and said, wow, they've described exactly what we're doing. Um, and that, but they learned what things they needed to do better. And that particularly relates to two things Jess has spoken strongly about, which is um, getting clear on the role of the backbone uh, and its unique role and strengthening that, but also shared measurement, getting disciplined about um, measuring the shared outcomes that the collaboration is to achieve. Um, but many initiatives or many communities or issues read about collective impact and thought this is something that could help us make change, um, the type of change we've yearned for and not been able to achieve. So there's been a significant increase over time. Last year we plotted around 75 uh, initiatives who were intentionally using collective impact or drawing on its conditions to inform their work. 
Now, this is um, a trend sort of figure, not, a, not an accurate figure, but you sh the graph, um, the picture that you're looking at on screen shows roughly where they are around the country. So um, the field has been evolving since 2011. The most common things that communities uh, are mobilising around or, or initiatives are mobilising around is early childhood um, and particularly cradle to career. So that might be across the life course from birth to your first job, but also um, focusing on different cohorts across that life course with, a, with a, 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 another group quite focused on uh, outcomes for young people as they're leaving school. The other place where collective impact has been um, taken up and uh, contextualised is in, in around Indigenous advancement and there are a cohort of Indigenous-led reforms around the country that are informed by, by this way of working. So if there's around 75 initiatives, there is, there's really still only a small handful that, are, um, that have been going long enough to reach a certain level of maturity where I would say they're past agenda setting, the, the process required for many diverse stakeholders to agree a shared agenda, and they have built the infrastructure required to implement and are now doing the hard work of implementing that agenda. Um, the bulk or the rump of the field is still in building readiness and the foundations to work this way. So what are we seeing? Well, to, say, to share a little bit about what we're seeing, let me also share the perspectives we bring when we, when we do look nationally, see what's going on. As Jess is so strongly um, framed, you would only reach the collective impact if you agreed that the problem or the challenge that you're trying to address is a complex one. You wouldn't convene diverse stakeholders across a system unless you were uh, attempting to make change in a complex problem. So the second lens we bring is that of systems thinking. So collaboration um, requires us to bring diverse stakeholders together and look at where can we intervene in the system that those stakeholders represent um, that in ways that will drive large scale change. So this, the, the great sort of tagline for this is service delivery alone will not solve the challenges that um, we're experiencing. We need other interventions to change the way the system operates and to get to root causes, change the conditions within which young children and young people are growing up in order to reach population level change. Now, while this field of collective impact is emerging, we do know that collaboration is considered one of the best approaches if you have a complex problem that requires system solutions as well as program solutions. So with that lens, what we're seeing in the three uh, domains that um, we're talking about on this webinar is turning to community engagement. We're seeing that everybody who is using collective impact as a way to frame their work is talking about community engagement, um, but they're experiencing it in ways that um, are challenging. So in many initiatives we're seeing uh, collaborators feel quite paralysed. They don't know um, from their own practice or their own organisation how to do community engagement well and they certainly don't know how to do it at scale. Um, the other uh, trend or, or pattern that we're seeing is that community engagement is often front-ended uh, at the beginning of collective impact initiatives and is seen as a project that has a start date and a stop date that you do to gather community insights in order to form agenda setting. It's not seen as a foundational way of working, an ongoing practice about being in relationship and dialogue with community and working um, with community uh, in a way that helps the citizens, residents, those that are affected by the challenge to um, frame the opportunities and determine the, their own solutions. So there's still quite a bit to do around community engagement. When we, when we sit and look at why, why is community engagement um, challenging for some initiatives, we really are unpacking questions of power. Are experts in social change like policymakers and service providers prepared to start sharing power with um, benefactors and citizens? And um, uh, uh, how can we understand and unearth some of the assumptions that we might be holding? Um, one of which we hear or try to surface quite regularly is 
do those who have um, traditional power or traditional expertise, are they holding an assumption that if we hand power over to community, they will in fact make the wrong decisions? And once we name that assumption, how do we actually um, test, is that real? Is that some assumption correct? Our hunch is that if we start working around understanding the benefits of sharing power and really testing those assumptions around the skills and expertise of community, we'll be able to move past the paralysis and past the project-based approaches to community engagement. Okay, so turning to leadership and governance. If we accept the challenges we're grappling with are complex and we need to change the system, not just improve the programs that we deliver, then uh, it goes, it, it, the principle is convene a diverse group of people as you can and bring their assets and strengths towards um, understanding the challenge and coming to some shared solutions. What we're seeing around leadership is that most commonly um, cross-sector leadership tables are weighted by government and service providers um, or in fact exclusively held by government and service providers. Um, there are, there's not a strong presence of um, other actors in the system from business, philanthropy and academia and there's an even lower presence of citizens and those with lived experience at the leadership level. What we see happen is that when government and service providers get together, as Jess has already alluded to, there is a, a almost predetermined focus on service delivery as the, the primary way of making change, as the primary solution set. So the types of characteristics we see is a dominance of program and technical thinking, um, people moving to agenda setting very early uh, in the process of in the life of a collaboration, um, limited engagement with community, often to understand other services that we're offering to you now good enough, do they meet your needs and if not would you like to be involved in designing new services and um, a very predictive, planned, linear approach to making change. When we know in complexity, we need much more experimentation um, around their intervention sets. And the last thing we're seeing is low levels of learning and adaptation when, um, when the leadership tables comprise predominantly of government and service providers. When we seek to look at the behaviours that are, are driving that, again, we think those behaviours are connected to um, apologies. Those behaviours are connected to power dynamics. So let me jump back to the slide. So our hypothesis that we test with collaborations um, uh, is this that we prefer to work with people like us. Um, when we engage diversity, people by definition come with different understandings of the challenge and different opinions about the solutions and does it make us feel uncomfortable? Are we avoiding that? Um, are we avoiding sharing power? And a very strong narrative is we're not the ones that need to change, it's others out there, it's government that needs to change, it's families and, um, and that need to change, or it's the way businesses operate and employ people that need to change, it's never ourselves. So <clears throat> one of the things we observe is there are a plethora of theories of change on how to change behaviours in the lives of children, young people and their families, and we need those. They're, they're the evidence base, they're the, the, the practice that many of us turn to when we're seeking to make change. But there are very few theories of change or frameworks that help us understand what are the behaviour changes we need in other parts of the system. How does government change its structurally and change its behaviours to align to the shared goals? How do service providers structurally change and behaviourally change to achieve the shared goals? And similarly, business, philanthropy and academia. And this to me is where the promise of collective impact lies and how exciting it is that there are 75 plus initiatives um, having a crack at this because they will be emerging. What are the theories of change that create structural change locally and behaviour change um, locally so that everyone is aligned to the shared goals of, um, of achieving better outcomes for children, young people and their families. So um, if we don't have theories of change for how to change um, behaviours of government service providers and other actors in the system, I think we end up doing something like this. Um, we, we believe that bringing people together to collaborate uh, will create some magic and 
you know, we'll have more alignment and better outcomes, when actually what we need is um, quite strategic, disciplined, collaborative processes. And those that are really knuckling down and, and working out the, um, the practice of how to implement collaborate, a collective impact, I think are generating those theories of change. So the last one is evaluation. Um, similar to Jess, I think the primary purpose of evaluation in uh, collective impact initiatives, certainly the primary purpose in the beginning, in those early stages, is actually strategic learning. How do you get data and insights quickly back to the, collaborat back to the collaborators and those involved uh, in the change process? Uh, how do people um, use data? to be able to adapt the interventions based on changes in the context and the learnings they're experiencing. So it, it is fundamentally a driver for um, cementing, a new way or, um, cementing a new way of working. Our current way of working is very linear, um, very predictable, and we need to move to more adaptive, more experimental ways of working that are well informed by data so that we're making the best uh, informed decisions we can. What we're seeing is that um, in the evaluation community in Australia, there are very few evaluators that um, either know how to work this way or are authorised to work this way. Um, evaluators are still very much um, doing formative and impact evaluation. They're not, um, either they don't hold roles or they don't have the skills and confidence to actually get into collaborations, run alongside them help them understand in real time what data and insights do you need and then go out and get them in a rigorous way that is timely to help the collaboration make better decisions. So we see this as a great developmental need if the field of collective impact is going to continue to evolve in Australia and deliver on some of its promise. So that's probably enough from me. Um, over back to you, Jess. Thanks, Kerry. That was really great. Um, we are just going to finish up by putting on the pre-recorded um, presentation that Arlene did for us a few days ago. So I'll leave it with Arlene. So thank you for inviting me to talk about um, how Community Dimensions has applied the Collective Impact Framework. I guess before I speak to the three key areas of uh, community engagement, governance and evaluation, I just wanted to provide some background context to the project and what we're hoping to achieve. Slide. The uh, work of Community Dimensions is actually concentrated in the three local government areas of Perth and Western Australia. That's Gosnells, Armidale and Serpentine, Jaredale. The project itself was actually um, born out of discussions the um, Communities for Children facilitating partner had with some other organisations in the area about how we could improve outcomes for children. There was actually a youth partnership project that had applied the collective impact framework um, and started some early work in the area and the question was asked could we use the same framework to improve the outcomes for children. The name itself, Community Dimensions, um, was driven from a leadership group member who had seen her son play Lego Dimensions where Batman might be working with Scooby-Doo and Homer Simpson might be driving Batman's car and they're all doing it to um, get up to the next level and for us that really spoke to the idea of what collective impact was about that we could use each other's resources um, to change um, the future direction. Slide. Some of the key signposts for change for us in the community and why we wanted to implement collective impact was things like our children and care statistics um, and our family and domestic violence statistics in particular because the Armadale district had the highest number of incidents and reports compared to any other area in the Perth metro area. Um, the percentage increase was continuing each year and no matter how much um, money or new programs were being put into the area we didn't seem to be making any significant change and again our AEDC results whilst they had were improving they still weren't great in comparison to other areas. Slide. So we've been on, on a bit of a, a journey of, of engagement um, and our journey map sort of highlights some of the key things that we've done. But what we realised very early on is that it wasn't about the three or four people that had sat around the table at the start of the journey talking about collective impact, that we really needed to be ensuring we're engaging the whole community around that vision for change. So 
we started the process by asking is collective impact something we want to use and we brought a number of service providers together back in March 2017 um, just to learn a little bit more about collective impact and um, share the idea about how potentially we could use it to improve some of these statistics around our children. There was an overwhelming support from that um, and so that really took us on the on the first step of our journey. Since then we've implemented numerous initiatives including our Say It Like It Is survey, our Growing Conversations Trees which our playgroups um, did in the area for us and we held about five tables of 20. Now those tables of 20 brought um, four groups um, consisting of five members, each from your community members, so your mums and your dads, your business and your industry, your not-for-profit services and your local government. Um, and I guess we had a really uh, scientific method um, of engaging people post each of those initiatives just by asking them if they wanted to be involved to pop their name on a, on a popsicle stick and leave it in the jar at the end of the day. So we started to collect, we've got now probably over uh, 70 people who want to be part of the journey with us. Slide. So given that we had over 70 people that wanted to be part of the journey, we, we sort of needed to reevaluate where our leadership and our governance structure was heading. We started in the very early days where um, obviously Communicare had funding for myself as a project officer. Um, and we engaged the initial four organisations to form a leadership group and we asked who else should be at the table. So we really at that stage were just looking at services um, and we hadn't really involved community members. By the time we'd gone through a, a series of um, surveys and tables of 20s, we obviously had over 70 people who wanted to be part of the process. So by February 2017, we went back and said, look, is this something now we feel how we can involve all of those people that wanted to be involved? So we had, you know, four, potentially four groups, so, you know, people who could connect with community, people who could support us around some of our governance and sustainability, some people who could gather around the data and research and evaluation to help drive the project, and people who were interested in communications. Obviously, at the centre of that was our community aspiration and our values, which at that time got articulated as keeping children safe uh, for, a, for a better future and in particularly keeping children safe from abuse and neglect. Um, at the bottom of that we also said that we would like to have some um, kind of strategic guidance, some system changes and system thinkers that could provide sort of um, twice yearly support in, in terms of direction and for research and um, connection back into the community and what was happening for that local community and potential um, policy change. And, when the community reviewed that as a potential government structure, there was a general agreement around it, but it really felt that, again, a leadership group needed to be involved. So the blue circle in the current governance structure speaks to that. So the alignment group is now drawn from the membership of each of the other four working groups. And we also had people who said, I'm really interested in being involved, but I can't commit for um, a significant amount of time each week or each month but I'm available to be on call for particular things if needed. So there was another group who became our friends of community dimensions. Um, at this point in time we, because we really just at the end of July defined our focus area around keeping children safe from abuse and neglect, we are now looking to set up that strategic and um, system thinkers group. Slide. Guess to support our leadership um, structure, we also needed to work out how do we make some decisions, um, who needs to be involved in those decisions. So we established this um, community engagement and decision making matrix. The um, I guess the essence of this is that the higher the level the decision, the more people that actually need to be engaged in that decision. So whilst a high level decision might sit with the alignment group, it's really important for the alignment group to be engaging all of the other groups in that decision. So that includes the action group, the community dimension teams and the executive of the alignment group as well. Um, part of the process as well for us to 
provide some clarity around what each of the working groups were doing and the decisions that were being made and what was being asked of them was to develop a project brief template. So that for us really spoke to the task that was at hand for those action groups um, and some of the milestones that we'd be looking to achieve. Slide. So I guess I, I liken community dimensions to a bit of a hop on, hop off bus. Um, when the project started, we started with a very broad aim, um, which multiple people could align to. But I guess as we've narrowed the focus and we've defined the issue as keeping children safe from abuse and neglect, some people felt that that didn't, that wasn't something they could align to as well and so naturally hopped off the bus. We've also had um, parents who've been engaged with us along the way who suddenly had their second child or they've gone back into the workforce so there's been that natural attrition and there's also you know likewise with services and government people moving in and out of organisations and restructuring of departments that's meant that we've um, you know, had some changes there in terms of our governance and, and capacity for people to contribute. We've obviously operating our structure in a very much a shoestring budget with uh, just one worker allocated to the project and it really drawing on the support from the community and, and service and governments um, to support, I guess, provide that infrastructure for us. Slide. So when looking at how we're evaluating, our, I guess, our success, um, there's a few things that we have done. And uh, to be honest, I can admit that we could probably do better. Um, I think what we have done well is that we've tracked our outputs. So we've looked at who we're actually engaging and if we're engaging the right people. Uh, some of the things that we've also done along the way is really track how, what our members' experience is with the collective um, and those are some of the quotes that you'll see there that, that's been shared with us. The other thing that we've sort of done well is look at the health of the leadership group, be that the original leadership group or how we're going now with our current alignment group. Um, and one of the things I guess that we've started to do is really add some learning focus items onto the agenda. So each session we're looking to learn a little bit more about collective impact and also reflect on what we might have learned or take away from each of the meetings as well. Slide. We've also looked um, to the FSG framework for evaluating the work of the collective by looking at the four key areas in terms of the, the context within which we're operating, um, the initiative and how we're doing ourselves and our learning culture, uh, how we're influencing the system so that behaviour and policy level change and impact. And obviously in the first two years, we really only have defined the issue um, and we're really only gathering data around the context um, both in terms of the community and the political context and how well we're going in terms of building the capacity of the project and our learning culture as well. As I guess that's, that's the main thing for us, it's really seeking to understand the lived experience. Um, we've also developed a logic model uh, to guide us in our project. Um, but we really feel that for us, the next stage for our project is more about um, how do we look at providing some kind of sort of developmental evaluation and maybe action research that both um, contributes to the project and evaluates the relationships and the learning culture that is part of what we're doing. Um, so this is, I guess, a big focus for us as we move into the new year. So hopefully this is giving you a good understanding of uh, where Community Dimensions is at and I'd just like to thank you for allowing us to share the journey we've been on to date.